They should give me combat pay for this one. The hypocrisy here is incredible. They're going to spend the first 10 minutes, by the way, discussing how awesome each one is. I am not kidding. It takes 10 minutes to get into the actual discussion because they're patting each other on the back. Put on your seatbelt. It's going to get real thick here now. Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brain waves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. Here we go. ...fear of black people. <laughs> so tell us why you believe that it was important to tell a new originary tale of race and rights in relationship to the Second Amendment. Um, and so this book emerged out of the killing of Philando Castile. Um, and this was a black man who was pulled over and, and uh, by the police. And when the police asked um, to see his ID, he said, I just want to let you know he's following NRA guidelines. I have a license to carry weapon. The police officer began shooting and killed Philando Castile simply because he had a weapon. Really? Wow. She has taken that Philando Castile event and she has dissected it, analyzed it from every angle. Because she's an intellectual. What actually happened? Well, let's take a look. By the way, the police officer is a person of color. They don't mention that too much. Okay. Well, sir. Good. How are you? Good. Uh, reason I put you over to your brake lights are out. So you only have one activator active brake light, and that's going to be your passenger side one, your third brake light, which is up here on top. And then this one back here, it's going to be out. Okay, he's pulled him over for a brake light infraction. He can do that. That's called probable cause. They often do this because they're looking for people with warrants. Nothing wrong with that. If you don't like it, fix your damn taillights. And by the way, the white guy, the one on the far right, he doesn't do anything. You have your license for the shirt? Okay, he says, I have a firearm on me. And the police officer says, well, don't reach for it then. What does Philando do? Don't pull it out. Don't pull okay, he's told him now this is his third time. Don't pull it out. Okay. Now, was the police officer justified in what he was doing? In my opinion, I think he overreacted. Now, that's just my opinion. I don't know what he saw. Maybe he really did see Philando pulling out something that looked like a gun. I don't know. Whatever the case, it certainly does not resemble anything that she described. Let's go back and listen to it again. This was a black man who was pulled over and, and uh, by the police. And when the police asked um, to see his ID, he said, I just want to let you know he's following NRA guidelines. I have a license to carry weapon. The police officer began shooting and killed Philando Castile simply because he had a weapon. Simply because he had a weapon. No, that's not what happened at all, lady. The police officer opened fire because he thought Philando was reaching for it. Philando was reaching for something. It might have been his wallet. It might have been for his gun. We don't know. Maybe they have to deduce that. I don't know. I didn't follow the trial that closely. I do know, however, it wasn't simply because he had a gun. What she is portraying, that Philando said, uh, I'd like to let you know that I have a gun, and that the police officer just started opening fire on him, that did not happen. And you know what? She knows that didn't happen. She had to know. She said she based her book around this event. So how many times did she watch that clip? Certainly a number of times. She had to have known that the police officer told Philando three times to not reach for it. So what she's doing is called lying. She's lying. She knows what she's saying is misleading.
that she's saying it anyway. This is why I call this propaganda. This is propaganda because she knows that the message is false, but it gets her what she wants. The NRA, the guardian of the Second Amendment, went virtually silent. Which also, as another uh, point, Philando Castile was not carrying his weapon legally. He was stoned. Toxic analysis came back. He had marijuana in his system. Can't carry a weapon if you're under the influence. So, so the idea that he was doing everything according to NRA guidelines is not true. Which then led a uh, journalist to ask, well, don't black people have Second Amendment rights? And that's what got me on this hunt. And it sent me back into the 17th century. And there what I saw was this incredible fear of the enslaved. Okay, so what she's going to do now is not advocate for black people having the Second Amendment rights, but rather to take away Second Amendment rights from everyone, because at one time black people did not have them. This incredible fear of black people, the fear of, and, and defining them as dangerous, defining them as a threat to white society, and seeing the infrastructure, the laws coming up that were banning black people from having access to weapons, as well as the slave patrols and the militia that were used to control and the fear of, and, and defining them as dangerous, defining them as a threat to white society, and seeing the infrastructure, the laws coming up that were banning black people from having access to weapons, as well as the slave patrols and the militia that were used to control and contain and subjugate black folk. And in watching then as the war comes on and the fear of arming black people, arming the enslaved, and what that meant, and then the battles over the Constitution um, that had the bargaining happening with the three-fifth clause and the Atlantic slave trade. And okay, she's making some sense here. I mean, these are things that def definitely happened. I mean, I'm not saying everything that she's saying is wrong. I think she makes some good points here. And then the ratification convention in Virginia. And, and there, it became very clear for Patrick Henry and for George Mason that having the militia under the control of the federal government in the Constitution was verboten. What they were afraid of is that they would be left defenseless because they couldn't trust the North to send the militia down to, to put down a slave revolt. They said, we will be left defenseless. Um, and, and, and that they put pressure on James Madison for a bill of rights and for the protection, the protection that they needed from a possibility, a very real possibility of a slave revolt, and that possibility was the militia. That I think oh. So her claim is, is that because Patrick Henry and George Mason wanted a Second Amendment right to prevent slaves from being able to mount an insurrection, that that's the reason why we have the Second Amendment. It's not true. I don't see any evidence whatsoever that James Madison formulated the Second Amendment based on anything that Patrick Henry or George Mason said. James Madison is the father of the Second Amendment. He wrote extensively on why we needed a Second Amendment. No mention of slave rebellions anywhere. And there was no reason why he would have omitted it. I understand that not everything we know about history is really as rosy as we thought. But that doesn't give you the right to replace it with stuff that's equally wrong. The Second Amendment was not founded on slavery. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, if I can interject, I mean, what, what I think that Carol does brilliantly, you know, in, in, in this book, uh, is to dissect the myth-making that has gone into what all what these amendments and, and the origin of the country is all about. Because the, the, the defenders of the Second Amendment, what have you, think is all about defending um, Freedom is it's about defending you know the the um, states from an imperial government or it's about in, in, in defending the states from a foreign power. When she points out clearly, the militias were incompetent to do that. They were totally incompetent to do that. What they what they were competent to do was to chase down escaped enslaved people. Uh, they were incompetent to do that. Um, ask the British. Now I'm not saying that we didn't need France's help. However, the British found out pretty quickly that a whole bunch of people bringing their weapons in from their homes can be a formidable army once they are organized. The Second Amendment's purpose is to form a militia in case freedoms are attacked. And you can't form a militia if you have the population unarmed. People need weapons. That's why we have it. James Madison wrote about this extensively. There's no reason for her to be ignorant of this fact. And by the way, this whole myth-making thing, what they're claiming is, is that 
a lot of what we know about our history is a myth. So why don't we replace those myths with myths of our own? And that's what they're trying to do. And, and, and that sort of became their central function, you know, uh, and to the extent they had a function that made any sense, you know, um, and I think you know, just as just as just just my hat off to, to, to Carol, because I think she's doing a great service. There's a lot of this crowing to each other about how great they are. They spend most of the time, it seems like, complimenting each other on how smart they are. It's a little sickening. And demystifying this history, because so much of what we think we know about our Constitution, about the origins of this country, about our own history, And I just want to draw the dotted line from what you just said to Carol and talking about Kyle Rittenhouse and the alternative narrative that was crafted around this man's, you know, taking an AR-15 sure. into a town and shooting <laughs> and killing people and walking straight out and getting in a car and going home. But the narrative, the truth that emerged from that was that this was a good man. He was stepping, good boy. He was stepping in when um, the, government, the, the local officials had failed. And that is, I think, um, if I could, connecting what um, Alice is saying about this, this idea of what is truth and what gets considered truth. Right, and, and, and that Kyle Rittenhouse story, for me, is watching them say, you know, this was just part of, he was just exercising his Second Amendment right to a well-regulated militia. Um, and you see that the police were not threatened by him. So this 17-year-old carrying an AR-15 that he had legally obtained, uh, it's an illegally obtained AR-15, they're not threatened by him. And and the reason why was because he wasn't doing anything threatening. He was walking around with it. He wasn't threatening people, despite what a lot of people say. The police had no reason to fear him. Nobody did. You watch the video. Nobody there feared Kyle Rittenhouse. He walked amongst the crowd and they just basically stared at him. He guns down three people and he gets this basically this hero's welcome in the right wing press. Meanwhile, with Tamir Rice, who was the 12 year old black child uh, playing alone in Cleveland in an open carry state, the police roll up on him within two seconds. They gun him down because they see threat. So a black child playing with a toy gun in an open carry state where there's nobody around. So he's not violating any of the open carry laws, even if this is a toy gun. Um, that Look at the hypocrisy in all this. OK, she's making a big stink out of the fact that, well, Kyle was walking around illegally because he was 17 years old. But Tamir Rice, this was an open carry state. Tamir was 13. <laughs> and they can't even get their story straight. And what leads to this hypocrisy is an inability to analyze events to any degree of complexity. In her mind, Kyle Rittenhouse showed up at the protest and just started opening fire on people. That's how she's casting it. And then he just went on home. And that is the degree of complexity that she can do. She's not a critical thinker. She's not an intellectual. She can't analyze situations to that level. Tamir Rice. Well, they just pulled up on him. He's just playing with his toy gun, and they just opened fire on him. Let's ignore the complexity of that event. Now, keep in mind, I'm not claiming that the police were justified in shooting Tamir. But you can examine that to much more detail than she's doing. Tamir Rice did have a toy pistol, but he took the orange tip off so it looks real. I own a 1911, and believe me, I would not have been able to tell Tamir's toy gun from a real 1911 almost under any circumstances, and certainly not within a second. Now, why did Tammy Rice pull the orange tip off? Well, he wanted to play with it, and it's probably more realistic and fun to play with a gun that looks real. I get it. He's only 13 years old. I'm not saying that he's a bad kid for doing it, but I'm saying this is you can't ignore that as being a very big influence on what took place. The police pulled in too close to him. They didn't give themselves enough time to react adequately. Does that make them bad guys? No. They made a mistake. Did they overreact to Tam Harris pulling of the gun? Maybe. I'm not in their shoes. I didn't get to see what they saw. Maybe they responded adequately. Maybe they overreacted. 
But the truth of it is, they were told they were on the lookout for somebody much older. Tammy Rice is really big for 13 years old, and he easily passed for 16. And is a 16-year-old dangerous? Oh, yeah, you can bet they're dangerous. And so the police are told that there is a person waving a gun around. He's around 16 years old, and that's what they're looking for. A lot of people have said, well, the dispatcher was told it was probably just a toy. Yeah, but the dispatcher didn't tell the police officers that. They didn't know that. And so they were looking for somebody waving around a real gun. They pull in too close, they get out of their car, and Tamir reaches for the gun. They open fire. It's tragic. It was a horrible mistake on somebody's part. But to relegate that as just, well, he's playing with his toy gun, and they just pulled up and shot him. That's the level of thinking that she employs here. She can't think critically at all. Why? She's biased. She, her bias has taken over her, and she cannot be trusted to remark on these kind of events. Just like you can't take her word on why we have the Second Amendment. Bias is a huge problem for her. of um, the free speech, speech crisis that we find ourselves in right now is the Citizens United ruling, right? Well, and not just a ruling, but yes, but what's implied by all of them. Implied yes. by the ruling, like right. that corporations are people. Right. And then also the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and so could you talk a little bit about, you know, the crisis that is created and how we think about the freedom of speech as a fundamental liberty or right? Yeah, I think, I think in order to, to do that, just a, a, a second of historical context, because, you know, the, the, the modern sort of idea of freedom of speech sort of comes from this Brandeis uh, notion, uh, you know, that through speech, you find truth, uh, and that the more speech there is, the more truth you get, and the better decisions get made in society because there's more speech, uh, and that good ideas drive out bad ideas, uh, and that speech just by uh, being um, allowed and uh, exhibit it makes you a better nation. And what we're finding, you know, is that several things. We're finding that number one, uh, good ideas don't necessarily drive out bad ideas. Uh, we're we're learning that truth doesn't necessarily drive out lies. Yeah, truth doesn't necessarily drive out lies. Are you talking about lies like the cop just shot Philando Castile because he was carrying a gun? Is that the kind of lie that you're having the troubles with the truth driving out? Uh, we're learning that if you speak loudly enough and lie consistently enough, um, that can undermine any notion of truth uh, that exists in society. Right. If you lie enough, that can drive out truth. And you guys have been lying and lying and lying all this time about the whole police brutality deal. Philando Castile is not the only one. We already talked about Tammy Rice. Have you lied about that as well? You could go through the whole gamut of it. Micaiah Bryant was unarmed. That was a lie. We heard it all the time until we found out that, nah, she was carrying a knife. Jacob Blake was unarmed. Well, until we found out that he was carrying a knife. These lies permeate the entire notion of police brutality. And yes, if you tell the lies over and over and over again, it's hard to get the truth out. You know what else makes it hard to get the truth out? Let me show you. Comments are turned off. That's right. That's what sometimes makes it hard to get the truth out, is when you put lies in your videos and then you turn off comments so that people can't correct them. Um, and, and when you connect that with power, which is the power to flood the airwaves with Right. Flooding the airwaves. Are you talking about like making YouTube videos where you introduce falsehoods about a shooting and then turn off comments that people can't correct you? Is that flooding the Internet? You don't seem to have any problems with it. You didn't have any problem posting this on YouTube. Messages uh, to flood uh, the Internet with messages. You end up where we are now, you know, with the vast majority of Republicans thinking the election was stolen, stolen from them. If they think that, they're entitled to believe that. And they're entitled to tell others that they think that it was stolen. It's called the right to form an opinion. And they don't want you to have it. You see, 
they have serious problems with the freedom of speech because you might form opinions they don't agree with. That's what this is about. Uh, you know, that's an exact, you know, that's a, 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 a clear reflection of this, of, of this reality that speech and speech of itself does not clarify. Uh, it can often muddy you know, reality and leave you with all kinds of, of weird notions. Um, but the other thing about the, about the internet, you know, is that for, what, for all the flaws that they were with our society when it was a society where a relative handful of actors gave us our news, uh, there was at least the reliance that those decision makers were relatively reliable in one way or another. Yeah, that's no longer the case, is it? There was a time in our history where we could look at CBS and NBC and think what they're telling us is probably true. And frankly, I thank God that we have social media now, because if we had to rely on CNN and MSN and even Fox News for our news, we'd be in big trouble. They would have hung Kyle Rittenhouse by now. Um, we no longer have that. We, we, we have a, you know, a sort of a wild west out there where anybody with an internet connection um, can get online and spread messages, but it's even worse. <laughs> and the lady on the upper left is going like, um, I just posted this on YouTube. Is he talking about me? Well, no, he's not talking about you. You're exempt from any of this. If as long as you have messages that you think are good, it's OK. You could post them all over. It's those who have contrary opinions. They're the ones that are messing up everything. Worse than that. Because of what we have learned from the research is that the crazier your message is, you know, the more likely it is to get read and to get views. You know, so you have, so you have, you know, the, the, the whole idea of Holmes and Brandeis about speech clarifying gets turned on its head. Um, because in, in this sense, you tell people that there are, you know, democratic pedophiles out there uh, who, are, who are running the nation. Uh, all of a sudden, you have millions and millions of people who believe that and act on that. Oh, you mean like the Russian collusion thing, too? For the record, Pizzagate was ridiculous, all right? However, it isn't just conservatives doing this kind of stuff. And I don't have a solution for how you deal with that, but I think that's clearly one of the huge problems that we're facing now in terms of how we deal with speech. And you know what, I just have to say, this just ties, I just love this conversation because it just, it just, I love it. So like, even thinking about you, Carol, what, one of the things that was really compelling to me in your telling of the, the history of the second minute was white fear. Like it was just permeating the whole book. It was this idea that don't, the blacks can't rise up, the Haitian revolution, no, don't bring it over here, send the French slaves back. You know, so, you know, what about that? You know, this idea of the, the fear, which I think both you and Alice are, are talking about. That fear is so real. One of the things that I argued in an op-ed is that we've got, we're dealing with uh, uh, at least two pandemics right now. One is mass shootings, right? And the other one is anti-blackness. And the anti-blackness is, is precluding any kind of real movement on gun safety laws. Because what you have happening is this fear that if they don't have their guns, they will be left defenseless. I mean, we hear we heard that from Charlton Heston. We hear that from Lauren, Lauren Boebert. We hear it over and over. Jonathan Metzl's book, Dying for Whiteness, deals with this as well. We're well, you know what? It's a dangerous world out there. And I want my gun. I don't give a damn about your problems. You're not going to strip me of my protection just out of your own sociopolitical concerns where whites who have dealt, had dealt with gun violence in their family really don't want any gun safety laws because they are afraid that if they don't have their guns, that all of those folks will come in from St. Louis and take what is theirs. Yeah, that's not what they're saying. They don't, no one's saying, well, I'm afraid that people from St. Louis are going to come down and invade my home. They don't care where they come from. They just see it, that there is a dangerous world out there, and it could come from anyone. What she is saying is, is that if you want self-protection, you must be racist. And no, that's not an oversimplification. She's saying it. Those people who want a gun for self-protection are only doing it because they don't like black people. So that fear of being left defenseless to the black board, right, is what is, is precluding moving forward on any kind of sensible. So what, what it's saying is that we are willing to risk 
safety at the grocery store. Uh, yeah, by leaving our guns at home, we're perfectly safe. Is that your argument? The best way to be safe at the grocery store is to not have any self-protection. At church, at work, in a parking lot, um, at the club, wherever we go, we're willing to risk that safety so that we don't have to deal with the black horde coming in and taking our stuff. It is illogical, but that is what that fear has done. It, it has messed up public policy, something fierce. And it has turned the Republican Party into a party which is embracing every anti-democratic principle possible in order to keep a um, outnumbered minority in power. And he goes on with his uh, political stuff for quite a while. The arrogance is amazing here. The inability to analyze any kind of event from a standpoint of complexity, non-existent. They spend most of their time casting everything, everything in terms of race. Like my video, subscribe to my channel.